All right, well, uh, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd invite you to turn in them to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. As we have been going through Advent, there are four Sundays. And so, as we together prepare ourselves to celebrate the birth of Christ, we wanted to see what the, what the evangelist Luke said as he wrote about the announcement of Christ's birth to his mother Mary this morning. So if you would please listen, follow along uh, in your, on your Bible, on your phone, on your tablet, whatever you may be reading on, as we read together Luke chapter 1 verses 28 through 30, or verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant. Let it be, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would please bow your heads with me and let us pray. Our Father and our God, as we examine the announcement to your servant Mary this morning, would you grow our faith, strengthen us by your word. We pray in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Perhaps one of the most exciting and anticipated moments and been also stressful times in a woman's life is the planning of her wedding. And, and of course, not every woman want, gets married or even wants to be married. However, uh, it's the thing that so many dream about from their childhood. Uh, you know, ever since she was young, she would, a woman might wake up early in the morning to watch the royal wedding happening across the pond over in England, to watch Diana marry Charles, or maybe Kate to wed to Will, or maybe more recently, Meghan Markle to marry Harry. Right, once the ring is on the finger, it's off to the races. What date will we be married? Where will the venue be? What will the flower arrangements be like? What traditional elements do we want in the wedding service, and what unique elements to us do we want to include? Well, I learned that whenever I was planning my own wedding, uh, I learned this really intensely, that it's really exciting and stressful for the women. You know, as one half of the couple-to-be, I thought that I would probably have about one half of the decision-making power in the planning of the wedding. Uh, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> uh, the math still worked out, and, and here's why. Because I had considered the details of the wedding um, from the time that I purchased the ring. But my fiance, Samantha, had been thinking about the details of her wedding since she was about seven years old. And so she had dedicated a lot more thought into this event than I had. Right? And as tiring as it was, you know, wedding planning is a much more exhausting activity than you might imagine. Than in, it's more exhausting in reality than it is in fantasy. It, it was a joyful and exciting time. The wedding itself was, but also the planning of the wedding. Uh, you know, we were planning uh, on this holy wedding ceremony before God, where before God and man, we would, the two would become one flesh by covenant of marriage. Well, in our text today, in verses 26 and 27, 
uh, we meet a young woman named Mary, and we're told that she's a virgin. She's betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And betrothal was like a more formal version of engagement in our end. She was, in all intents and purposes, legally married, but there had not been a ceremony. There were no conjugal relations yet. And we meet Mary. She's a young woman. Right? Marriage happened much earlier back in the day. And so she was likely anywhere between the ages of 14 and 16 years old, preparing for her wedding, likely with the women in her family. And this, again, would be an exciting time. She's working with her mother, her cousins, her aunts, her grandmother, maybe even Joseph's mother and sisters to plan this ceremony. And in the midst of all of that planning, she gets a very startling visit from an angel, Gabriel, who shows up in the middle of all that and says, you are going to conceive a son. And his name will be Jesus. For all the things that you might encounter during wedding planning, that is typically not one of them. That's not on the agenda. But how Mary responds to this instance is very instructive to us, I think. As we consider all of the responses in Scripture to the pronouncement of God. And so as we examine Mary's story in Luke today, here's what I hope you'll see. That Mary provides for us a prototypical example of faith in Jesus Christ as she trusts in God's pronouncement his person, and his power. I'm going to say that one more time. Mary provides for us a prototypical example of faith in Jesus Christ as she trusts in God's pronouncement, his person, and his power. Well, the first thing we encounter in our text today is God's pronouncement, God's pronouncement, namely this divine favor. All right, the opening scene in our text today is very similar to the one we saw last week whenever we were looking at the story of Zechariah. An angel appears, and there is some trepidation on the part of the recipient of this message. Right? The, the, but nevertheless, the angel issues a word of assurance to not fear, and a divine birth is pronounced. Gabriel, sent by God, in verse 28, says this, Greetings, maybe your Bible translation says, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. Right? This phrase doesn't have many words, but it says a whole lot. Right? The word there for greetings in the Greek is also the word for rejoice. Rejoice, O oh favored one. And it's paired with this title that he calls Mary, favored one. And another way we could say that is one who has received God's grace. God's grace has been bestowed upon Mary. It's important to realize that it is God who gives this grace. Now, as we encounter Mary, we know that she's not just some willy-nilly random person going through Galilee. By all accounts that we have of Mary, she was a faithful woman. She was trusting the promises of God. She was looking forward to the day when God would deliver Israel, when God would send his Messiah. She was anticipating the fulfillment of God's promises, but she is the recipient of God's favor. She hasn't earned it. See, too often when we encounter God's grace when we encounter his favor, we do think that it's something that we deserve. It's something that we have earned or something that we should receive by right. Right? If God knew how good we were, he would reward us. Right? We think that our obedience is what precedes God's kindness. If we're good, if we're awesome, then yeah, God's going to want to bless us. He wants us to be on his team. And maybe... We look at the back end of that. Because God is blessing me, it must be because I've done so many good things. And sometimes we assume the flip side of that. If you are not being blessed, if for some reason you are suffering, it must be because you don't have God's favor. You must not have been a good person. We may not say it out loud, but we sure do think it. Brothers and sisters, if we treat God this way, we're not treating God like God. We're treating God like he's Santa Claus. Right? We think that he's making a list and checking it twice and he will find out who's naughty or nice. He is omniscient. And so whenever God comes, if I've been a good person, right, if I have been respectful in public, if I make a comfortable living, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't run with those who do. If I've made the right decisions when I've come to the crossroads, then I'm on the nice list. I should receive God's blessings. Consequently, someone who is not good, maybe you're a bad neighbor, you don't have a nest egg waiting for you in the bank. Right? You cuss a little too much. You failed to get the GPA that you need. 
for your desired school or scholarship, you're on the naughty list. You lose it all. You don't get God's favor. You don't deserve his reward. But one of the things that we see throughout the entire Bible is this, is that not one of us, no, not one, is righteous before God. In fact, his divine grace, his divine pronouncement is something that he gives to us. It is God who takes the initiative. It is God who gives irrespective of our condition or our lot in life. And it's once that God makes this pronouncement of grace upon us that we are blessed. Moreover, his grace produces joy. I'm going to give you a quick lesson in Greek. I don't want to do this often. But the word for joy in Greek is kara. The word for grace in Greek is charis. They're the same word, but for one or two letters. And I can think we can say with confidence that whenever we receive the grace of God, whenever we receive his charis, we also get his joy, his kara. So whenever Gabriel says, hail, greetings, rejoice, favored one, we know that it is God's grace that brings joy. Whenever the angel pronounces to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verse 10... Behold, I bring you good news of great joy. It is a message of grace that produces joy in the shepherds. And one of the major ways in which God's grace gives us joy is by giving us his personal presence. His personal presence. This is one of the most dominant themes throughout the entire Bible. Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. Think of a text like Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, when you go through the sufferings of life, I will be with you. You go through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. Indeed, before Mary even knows that Emmanuel will be the one in her womb, God tells her that he is with her. God will be with her. Well, even though that is an amazing, gracious message from God... Mary's response is probably the same one that you and I would have. An angel has appeared and made this pronouncement to her. She's a bit troubled, perplexed. She's confused. It doesn't say that she fears like Zechariah does, but nevertheless, Gabriel tells her, do not be afraid. But as she receives this perplexing, confusing message, what we're also told is that she tried to discern these things in her heart, she pondered them in her heart. And indeed, this is something that we see about Mary throughout the Gospels, that whenever she receives a gift from God, her first response is to ponder that. As we hear in Luke 2, as Jesus grows up and matures into being a child, an infant to a toddler, to a child, to a young man, it says that Mary pondered, she held these things in her heart. And she rejoiced at the things that God had given her. Whenever God gives us grace, we too would be in the right to just ponder this. The grace of God. Oh, to grace, how great a, day, a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. God, let your goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. We sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Indeed, if we have received God's grace, we've received the salvation that he has given to us in Jesus Christ, we would do well to ponder that, knowing that it's not because of anything that we've done, but solely because of the magnificent and the magnanimous grace of God in Christ towards us. Well, as Mary receives God's pronouncement of grace, she also receives God's person, God's person, namely Jesus Christ. Because the grace that was bestowed on Mary is grace, it is a gift for a specific purpose. That she would bring the Son of God into the world. Look at verses 31 to 33 as we read Gabriel's announcement. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Just like God's promise concerning Elizabeth last week at the first half of Luke 1, Mary's told that she will bear a son, and she's told what to name the son, but this time the name is Jesus, which in Hebrew means Yahweh saves, the Lord saves. Indeed, this Jesus will be greater than John, for, for while John will be great before the Lord, 
Gabriel says that Jesus will be great. He will be the son of the Most High. Make no mistake about it. This child who Mary will carry into the world will be God's son. But he will also be David's son. Right? We're told in, in verse 27 that uh, Joseph is of the tribe of David. Or sorry, of the lineage of David. We're told that Jesus will reign on the throne of the, his father David, fulfilling the promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And that his, he will reign over Israel forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. And I think whenever we hear that there's no end, it means no limit at all. With regard to space, the kingdom of God will be universal. But it will also have no limit with regards to time, that it will be eternal. It's never going to stop. It will be all-encompassing. And the conception of Jesus in Mary's womb, it fulfills prophecies that we hear about and read about in Scripture. And that's one of the most exciting things about Advent, is it's a time for us to pause as we read back through the Old Testament and we see how God was preparing the way for the Messiah to come. Right in the Bible, we have this group of people called the prophets, and their main role is to speak a word of God to the people of God. And sometimes they, they have an official role. Like we think of someone like Isaiah, Jeremiah, they are official court prophets, and they have books that are really long that they wrote. But some of the prophets we read about in the Bible, we might read about them in the histories. We might only know their name, or sometimes we don't even know their name. Right? There are many prophecies that God spoke in the past. And those prophecies had to deal with the people's lives, who they spoke to. But some of those prophecies, while they were immediately relevant, they also had another dimension that was future-oriented. Right? As they prophesied the coming of the Messiah... Right? It's a prophetic pronouncement that God is not through with Israel, but that he would fulfill all the promises that he made to Abraham and that he made to Moses and that he made to David and beyond. God would be faithful to those. Reflecting on the gospel of Jesus, Peter wrote about these promises in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, where he says this, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person... Or time, the spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he, when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Indeed, the fact that Mary is going to have the Son of God in her womb fulfills what Zephaniah chapter 3 verses 14 to 17 says. Where the prophet says this, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice. Exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. He shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Indeed, as we think of how this text is fulfilled in the life of Mary, we know that she is the daughter of Zion. She is the daughter of Jerusalem. And it says the Lord is in your midst. And here's the thing about the Hebrew. That word for being in the midst of, in the middle of, it's another word that's used to describe the womb of pregnant women. The Lord, the King of Israel, is in your womb. A mighty one who will save. Remember, the name of Jesus means the Lord saves. And so as a result of God's pronouncement, not only do we have his favor, but also we have his person, his son, Jesus Christ. God become flesh through the womb of the virgin. And this raises an excellent question. You might be thinking about it. Mary thought about it, which is this in verse 34. Mary said to the angel, how will this be? Since I am a virgin, how will this be, God? How are you going to do this thing? Well, this brings me to my final point, which is that Mary's virginal conception of Jesus and birth reveals God's power. Mary's virgin conception of Jesus reveals God's power. Mary asks a good question, and it's actually the same question that Zechariah asked in Luke chapter 1, verse 16. After God told Zechariah that his old wife Elizabeth would conceive a child and would... Uh, give birth to John, 
Zechariah asks Gabriel, how shall I know this? He's asking for a sign. And Zechariah, we're told, failed to believe. He is made silent. He's made unable to speak until the child is born. And we're told it's because of his lack of belief. But Mary's question, how shall this be since I'm a virgin, it's different from Zechariah's on two counts. All right, the first is that as you think about an old woman having a child versus a virgin having a child, one of them is highly improbable. The other one really is impossible. Now, there's no way that the latter could happen by our knowledge. But, and, and Mary literally says, whenever she says, how will this be since I'm a virgin, she literally says, how will this be for I have not known a man. I do not know a man. So the chances of her conceiving a child are zero. But Gabriel answers this question in verse 37, and I want us to really meditate upon this for just a moment. For nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. How will he do this? Well, the angel in verse 35 says this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. In the Old Testament, we read about God's glory, his Shekinah glory, which is his manifest presence in the world. There are moments that we see him fill the tabernacle or he fills the temple uh, with his glory. People aren't able to stand. They're not able to look upon it. We think of the Ark of the Covenant that traveled around with Israel, and that's where God's presence was in the midst of his people. But what God's telling Mary is that your womb is going to be the new Ark of the Covenant as you carry around the Lord in your womb. You will be the new tabernacle. And indeed, John chapter 1, verse 14 says this. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that translation, dwelt among us, uh, it's actually the verb that says he pitched his tent. It's the same word that they would use to say set up the tabernacle in the Old Testament. The Lord became flesh and tabernacled among us. And he became flesh in the womb of Mary. And so thus, the virgin birth fulfills the prophecy which uh, Bill read for us earlier. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. John, we're told, John the Baptist, whenever he's born, he will be filled with the Spirit. But this child, he will be conceived by the Spirit. And the one who was to prepare the way for Jesus, as John prepares the way for Jesus, uh, one of the ways he does that is by um, Elizabeth being pregnant. That is a sign for Mary that this is going to be true for her. In verse 36, Gabriel says, Behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month in who, with her who was called barren. So God does the impossible. God does the impossible. But here's the second key difference between Zechariah's reaction to Gabriel and Mary's. And it's that Zechariah didn't believe, but Mary had faith. Indeed, her response is, again, the most instructive response to us as we think about how we would respond to God's grace. And it's the prayer that she prays, which I've called the prayer of holy indifference, which is this. Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary, you're a young woman. You are about to conceive a child without any other man which means it's not your fiancé's son. Your wedding is planning is going to be interrupted, right? Before you're going to, your body is going to go through such dramatic changes as a young woman, as you carry this child into the world. And Mary's response is this, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. You might need to hold the wedding off a little longer, but Mary responds with faith. Oftentimes, we see things that are impossible, and the things that we believe to be impossible are far more probable than a virgin becoming pregnant and giving birth to a son. But we still have less faith than Mary. We see the difficulties in front of us, and we react much more like Zachariah than Mary. We wonder... How will this pandemic ever end? When will the unemployment rate 
fall down to a percentage so that enough people can have all that they need. How will God provide for all that my family needs during this time? How will God work in my child or my grandchild or my great-grandchild's life to bring them to the Lord? Their hearts are so hardened to him. How will he save them and bring them to faith? How will God provide for all that the church needs? How in the world, during an Advent season where we aren't able to meet in person, how in the world are we going to raise our $2,000 goal for Lottie Moon? Brothers and sisters, these are all much less impossible than God bringing his son Jesus Christ into the world through the womb of a virgin. And I can't say that the road before us is, would be easy if only we would believe. Indeed, the servants of God through the ages have often encountered difficulty despite their belief. I can't say that God doesn't have many seasons of, just, uh, many seasons of trials for us to walk through as we walk in obedience and deference to his will. However, I do know that as we face these challenges and more, that if we have the posture of Mary, if we have the posture of faith, that God will make the impossible possible. Moreover, as we think about the reason that Jesus became a human, the, the reason that he was conceived in the virgin's womb, the fact that he lived a perfect life died upon the cross for our sins that you and I might, might be forgiven and reconciled to God and that he rose again from the dead, we might think, why would he do such a thing? It's because he loves us, because God loves us. Right To overcome the true impossible burden, which is that he makes dead men rise. He makes dead women to live again by the Holy Spirit, to quicken them to give them breath where there was none before. And so as we think about the season of Advent, as we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ, again, that might seem unfathomable, unfathomable to us, but it is what God has promised that he would do. And so if you're watching today, I would exhort you to believe, to trust this one, to trust this Jesus Christ, to continue along the way with us over the next few Sundays and even as we get to Christmas Eve in Christmas Day, as we look forward to the birth of the Messiah, Jesus, I'd invite you to continue joining us over these next few weeks. See why we believe and confess this Son, Jesus Christ, to be our one and only Savior. And so, as we ponder these things, I'd invite you, please, bow your head with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Again, as you pray today, I'd Maybe you're here today and you're hearing what I've said and you think, oh, that just doesn't make any sense. Or maybe you've heard the message about grace and you think, but God, if you really knew all the things I had done, there's no way you would forgive me. Well, today I would invite you to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, the way that we are saved according to the scriptures is by grace through faith not according to works. And so today, if you have never believed, I'd invite you, yes, even today, to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Ask the Lord. Confess before him your sins. Confess before him that you know you've done wrong things. And ask him for forgiveness. Tell him that you believe in, the son, in his son, Jesus Christ, for your salvation. Tell him that you would like to be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Spirit. If you've prayed this prayer, if you've prayed to receive the Lord, I'd invite you to reach out to us here at the church. Send us a message on Facebook. Send us an email. Give us a call. We want to know. God, would you be with us now? Father, we pray that as we hear your word, would you make us like your servant Mary today? As she pondered the grace in which you poured out upon her, as God, as she pondered what it would mean to carry the Messiah into the world, would you help us to have the faith that she had where she said, Father, we are your servants. Let it be to us according to your word. 
Father, we know that the way before us is difficult. The way before us in our own family lives, in our individual lives, it will be challenging. But God, you've promised us to give us new life by your spirit to all who have professed faith in Jesus Christ. And so would you help us in our earthly circumstances to not fear, to not doubt, but rather that we would trust you, that we would trust your pronouncement, your word, that we would trust your son, Jesus Christ, to sustain us and to save us. And God, would we trust your power, knowing that you can do the impossible. God, we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.